Super. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Florian. I'm a lecturer at RSM in Rotterdam. I'm coming live to you from Feyenoord in Rotterdam. I wish I could be with you, but right now um, my university does not allow travel. I also have to still do a COVID test today. Um, nevertheless, I've prepared a presentation. Um, let's hop right in. So this is uh, ideally going to form the second chapter of uh, my dissertation uh, titled Firm Death. Um, my first paper was a case study paper. This here is rather econometric in, in nature. I would never dare to approach it completely by myself. I have some serious support in the form of Chris, in the form of Abe and in the form of Philip. Hello guys, uh, by the way. We are uh, motivated to understand uh, the reasons for firms to fail. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons why we why would like to uh, attempt this. We think it matters a lot simply because there are all kinds of inefficiencies associated with firm failures. And they come, broadly speaking, in two flavors. Firms that fail yet would have been viable and firms that do not fail even though they should have failed. So we think it matters to understand this. However, there is a, a rather big empirical challenge. Corporate failures are rather rare. I mean, companies, small and medium enterprises, fail all the time. Corporations actually rarely do. So that means we have uh, a, a modeling problem simply because there are not that many corporations that, we can, that you can really analyze. Our approach, our attempt to deal with it is that we take a, a very long-term approach. We are in the process of conducting a long-term study on corporate failures in the Netherlands, covering a period of slightly more than 100 years. So through this, we are hoping to capture enough of these corporate failures to be able to make meaningful statements about them. There's a little bit more to it. I already said uh, that we are conducting uh, a long-term study and, and brief side note here, this is really work in progress. So I was running regressions yesterday at one in the morning still. So whichever comments you have, they will definitely benefit the paper greatly. We hope to contribute in different ways. So first of all, as I've already pointed out, we're trying to understand what causes these failures. So we're really looking for the determinants and not just what causes them, but also how they changed over time. Because we think it's realistic to, to say, well, over a period of 100 years, the whole environment has changed, or at least some aspects of the environment have changed. It's not unreasonable to assume that the determinants of corporate failure might have changed with the circumstances. Interesting to point out is here that uh, we need to distinguish between different kinds of failures. It's not only the case that firms fail because they go bankrupt. Firms can fail essentially for two different reasons. They can be liquidated or they can go bankrupt. I will elaborate in a, bit, a, little, uh, a little bit more on that. Um, we, it's a bit of a, a, a spoiler at this point, we suspect that there was a shift um, in the 20th century, roughly in the middle of the 20th century, from a very shareholder-centric uh, orientation of the firm, of the corporation, to a more stakeholder-oriented approach. I will elaborate on that as well. So we have, uh, uh, of course, looked at the literature. There is not that much literature on, on, on firm failure in that period. What has to be stated is that bankruptcy regimes differ, of course, around the world. Broadly speaking, you can distinguish between a harsh system and a soft system where a harsh system means the, that inefficient um, uh, liquidations are performed on firms that could have been viable, that could have been survived. Whereas a soft system can bring the disadvantage of the inefficient continuation of poorly performing firms. So either way, some inefficiencies seem to be part of, of, of the setup. Um, uh, yeah. A, a, a specific quote here, the, the differences in bankruptcy regimes seem to be obviously uh, a, a matter of uh, differing between different countries and these differences appear to be deep and persistent. We are not making a comparison to other countries, we are really strictly focused on the Netherlands here. Um, overall speaking, what should the, corp the corporate purpose be? Well, large corporations are expected to focus on stakeholder interests compared to solely shareholder interests. Please note here that these are sources that are relatively new. So 
Also, this here should be taken probably with a grain of salt in a historic context. So, how was the, the historic background in the Netherlands in the period that we are looking at? Uh, we had a liberal market economy until about 1940 um, with a couple of specific characteristics. So insider shareholders typically controlled listed uh, companies. That will also uh, become more evident in the analysis I'm about to present. Um, the influence of the board of directors, of creditors, certainly of employees and pretty much other stakeholders was very, very limited. And um, many exchange listed firms family firms here, were aiming for the continuity of uh, family control. Also that becomes quite obvious in our analysis. There was a transition period between uh, 1940 and about 1960. Obviously there was Second World War. Um, and in this period, this is very relevant for our research, there was a, uh, I almost want to say a groundbreaking Supreme Court ruling, the Forum Bank case. Uh, that really limited the, uh, the, the power that the shareholders wielded, the power that the, that the shareholder meetings actually uh, were wielding. Um, in the Forum Bank case, the situation was as follows, that the, the, uh, the management of the firm, the board of directors, wanted um, to essentially continue the firm. The shareholders were uh, very much against it. Uh, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the management of the board and basically stating then, giving the, 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 the authority to the board of directors to really, uh, to, to really call the shots. So after the Forum Bank case, um, we suspect a shift, meaning power was taken away from the shareholders and the management of the firms were empowered. Uh, we had from 1960 on, a coordinated market economy where corporations have the legal obligation to act in, excuse my Dutch, Belang van de Vernootschap, so basically to act in the interest of the corporation. As I've already mentioned, more power was essentially uh, assigned to the board of directors uh, at the expense of the shareholders. Uh, shareholders had, had basically to go along with, with the the opinion with the, the, the will of the board of directors um, and uh, we observe an increase in legal devices with all kinds of anti-shareholder rights from the perspective of the directors. Furthermore, the bankruptcy code, this is, this is I think the, 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 the key of our paper, the bankruptcy code has been unchanged sin, since 1893. So when I familiarized myself with the setup for the first time, I thought how interesting could this possibly be to study the determinants of corporate failure over 100 years in a country where the bankruptcy code has not been changed at all. However, then we stumbled across the, the Forum Bank case and this was for us a bit of a game changer. We found in Dutch law a rather important legal distinction. So this here is the part of the Dutch law that uh, essentially rules on the reasons why firms disappear, why firms fail. There are broadly speaking two ways how that can occur. Dissolution of the firm without conditions of bankruptcy present. So that is typically what is meant here would be a shareholder induced liquidation. In the context of the shareholder meeting, the shareholders decide, yes, we pull the trigger on the firm. This firm has to die. Uh, the second way how firms can fail is dissolution as a result of bankruptcy proceedings. So where really bankruptcy requirements are present, the, this kind of bankruptcy can theoretically be, this, sorry, this kind of failure, the bankruptcy, can theoretically also be triggered by shareholders. Practically it wasn't. Practically this is uh, usually triggered by creditors. Um, yeah, what's, what else is relevant? Um, the, in, between 40 and 45, uh, corporate taxes were introduced where we observed an higher leverages after the Second World War. What were our research questions? Or I should say, what are our research questions? We're still working on it. As I've already mentioned, we're interested in the determinants of corporate termination. So not just bankruptcies, just all failures together. What causes firms to be terminated between 1900 and 2002? 
And furthermore, if indeed the forum bank case caused a shift from shareholder focus to a more stakeholder oriented uh, purpose, um, has this affected the firm determinants? Uh, sorry, the firm determinants of termination, of, of failure. There are all kinds of interesting sub questions. Some of them I, I will address, some of them not because we are not quite there yet. So we ask ourselves are family firms different? That is, of course, totally possible. Do shareholder rights matter? What's the role of social networks? Um, does it uh, cause an impact if your firm has a banker on the board of directors? And this is something, the last two points we have not addressed yet at all, where liquidations of inefficient firms replaced by mergers and acquisitions. It's, it's totally conceivable that we end up analyzing our data and we conclude, aha, uh -huh, in the second period we find fewer liquidations. Why would that be? Because the Supreme Court has taken away power from the shareholders to pull the trigger. So we might falsely conclude that yes, our hypothesis is pretty much correct, when in fact simply liquidations have been replaced with something else that might not even be on our radar. That firms that used to be liquidated are now simply take not simply but are now taken over. So that is definitely something we want to look at. And last but not least, zombies. Um, it could very well be, or let me start differently, what we, what we plan on doing is that we uh, attempt to predict based on the first period which companies, based on the data of the first period, would have failed in the second period. And then see which of the firms that we predict to have failed have not. That's basically our current working definition of zombie firms. We have, of, of, of course, collected a ton of data. Uh, we have collected the data of listed non-financial firms between 1900 and 2002. The sources we used were the Hits by the Preiskurant, Van Oss Effecte book, and, of course, C Central Bureau of Statistik. Um, we have four our failing firms. We have tracked down the reasons why the firm lost their stock listing. Was it a liquidation? Was it a bankruptcy? Was it because they merged with another firm and stopped existing in the current legal form. Um, what I also did additionally, every single failing firm, I looked up on the, on the search engine Delphur. So I, uh, I accessed historic newspapers to really see for every instance what were newspapers writing. Was there a shareholder meeting? Was a liquidation really initiated by shareholders? So we use different sources, so we are relatively confident in the correctness of our data. We have accounting data, we have stock market data, we have board data, as well as all kinds of information on corporate governance. We are forced to exclude firms that were active on, on, on the Dutch East Indies after 1942, simply because based on the Japanese uh, invasion and the subsequent nationalization, these firms, typically plantations, seem to have failed, they, se they seem to have disappeared but for other reasons. Um, yeah, our eventual sample were, uh, are 1,061 unique firms across this rough century. We have 4,542 uh, firm year observations, out of which 172 firms fail. So this underlines a little bit the point I, I, I made before. We have a large universe of firms that do not fail. The number of actual failures is rather small. That's why we need to have such a big period. This is, I think, a key diagram. So if you look here, this is, of course, the timeline. Here I'm plotting numbers. And as you can see, we basically are looking at two different periods. We look here at period one. Here, this is the period we exclude from 1940 to 1960. And this is our second period. Um, as you can see here, the bars in red represent liquidations, the bars in blue represent bankruptcies. So you can already at a first glance see that there's something very different between the two periods. We have a lot more liquidations in the first period, far fewer bankruptcies, and in the second period we have almost no liquidations anymore. To be completely transparent and honest, the number of liquidations in the second period is so low that we cannot even tackle it econometrically anymore. So modeling failures 
general failures in the second period really means you're modeling bankruptcies, which is very different than the first one. We approach it in the following way. So we said our main dependent variable is a bino binomial choice variable that takes the value of 1 if a firm has failed and the value of 0 if it has not failed. Uh, we are running a huge set of logistic regressions. Um, here x represents a vector of variables of interest. So that is all the data we have collected, the financial variables, the board variables, the governance information. So all of this is packed in here. Um, we have um, data for every fifth year. Don't want to say only, but for every fifth year. Uh, and what we are doing is we try to explain failure using this data, uh, but not no data that is older than essentially four years. So that means, as an example, if we try to explain a failure in 1935, we explain it by using data from 34, 33, 32, or 31, not older. Yeah, let's have a look at the variables of interest. So what you see here are t-tests, a comparison in the first period, sorry, 1900 to 39, non-failing, failing. And already here we see quite a lot of significant differences. So this already confirmed or suggests strongly that yes, there are huge differences, of course, between fa non-failing and failing. We did the same thing for a final split now. The difference, are there differences between liquidations and bankruptcies? And also here we have to say, yes, there are differences. So obviously, not surprisingly, bankrupt firms, firms that went bankrupt in the first period were more leveraged. They used more debt. Um, and of course, what, is our, what does our model say or what do our models say? So this is uh, the regression output, determinants of failure of the first period until 39. Let me, let me walk it quickly through the, through the main result, uh, results. So in the first period, we observe mostly liquidations, very few bankruptcies. Um, what we see is that low, divid, um, low profitability and low dividend payments make failure, specifically liquidations, more likely. This together already explains about 50% of the variance. We also notice that larger boards make failures and in the first period liquidations more likely. We've been looking at the literature. I have to admit, I'm not really sure, quite, quite sure yet how to interpret it. We found that the Dutch two-tier board structure isn't generally used to reduce risk, yet it can give rise to potential conflicts of interest. I still have yet to make sense out of this. And we observe that governance reduces failure probability. Again, failure in the first period is mostly liquidations. So this explains 50% roughly of the variance. Let's look at the second period. Again, we have uh, t-tests comparing non-failing and failing firms. Not surprising, there are huge differences. Huge differences in size, huge differences in, in, in free cash flow, in dividend payments. So obviously, not surprisingly, they are different groups. We have also looked, of course, what do our regressions say about the determinants of failure in the second period. So what we see here, let me, let me, sorry. What do we see here? So we see that uh, in the second period where bankruptcies are dominating, there are almost no liquidations. We see that, for example, dividends, the fact that a company pays dividends makes failure less likely tangibility less likely. So I have an, a neat overview of the main insights and as, as, in a second. And as a last step, this is really work in, pro, uh, in progress still. We used our model that we have developed for the first period that explains reasonably well why firms failed in the first period with failures in the first period being mostly liquidations and applied it to the second period. So post 1960. And the idea here was to see Ideally, we would see gross differences so that our first period model does not perform too well in the second period. And that are our preliminary conclusions. Um, I've said this a million times. We observe fewer liquidations, mainly bankruptcies. But now we see the different variables increase the probability of failure, failure being then bankruptcy. More leverage. Firms that fail in the second period 
again, failure in the second period mostly means bankruptcy, are more levered. They use more long-term debt. We also see that profits do not matter uh, anymore. Only higher dividends matter. Furthermore, we see which firms are less likely to fail. Firms that use tangible assets, that have a lot of tangible assets, and firms that have a high market value. Uh, the financial variables by themselves for the second period are able to explain about 90% of the variation. And last but not least, governance metrics uh, are not that relevant. They only explain a little bit less than 6%. What are our overall conclusions? We think that our preliminary results support the idea that there was indeed triggered by the Forum Bank case, a shift in corporate purpose in the Netherlands. This shift, we think, occurred uh, around 1950. So not exactly when the Supreme Court published the ruling. It took a couple of years for this ruling in the Forum Bank case to spread, to permeate, permeate the, the, the basically society. Um, the effects of this shift come in a couple of different flavors. We obviously explain the reduction in liquidations and the increase in bankruptcies through this shift. The, how have the determinants of failure changed? Well, initially in the first period, pre-1940, profits mattered. Later on in the second period, we see a shift to leverage. So what this means in, in, in our view is that shareholders that were unhappy, that thought the firm is maybe viable, it's doing okay-ish, but the profitability, for my taste as a shareholder, is too low. I rather pull the trigger on the firm, get my investment out, and invest elsewhere. The Supreme Court took this possibility essentially away from the shareholders. Therefore, we see this shift from the importance of profits for the shareholders to an increase in the importance of leverage from the perspective of creditors. Uh, financial variables and governance variables explaining between 50 and 90% of the variation. And I would like to end on a couple of questions that popped up. I have to admit, I have no answers yet for that. I would be, of course, happy about any input that, that you surely will have. What about negative consequences for stakeholders pre-1940? So that I have not found any information on that yet. Um, it seems, when I read the Forum Bank case for the first time, I thought, ooh, that, is, that seems unreasonable uh, to take the power away from the owners, from the shareholders, uh, and, and, and uh, empower the management. However, I mean, that is a relevant question. What happened pre-1940 to the interests of the stakeholders? Apparently, not a lot. And another question that popped up is, what is more inefficient, liquidating a viable firm too early versus keeping a firm that should have failed a life. So that again would be the zombie idea. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I'll, I'll try to answer your questions. Can you repeat? The, the, the audio was a bit chopped off. I did not catch everything, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we have, we, have, we have tried all kinds of different um, uh, combinations. I have to admit from the top of my head, I've been running so many regressions that I cannot answer your questions on the spot. Um, I, I, but I do understand it would, that, it, that it would be relevant. I'm afraid I cannot immediately uh, testify to that. Sorry. No. 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 Maybe I, I, I wasn't a little bit inaccurate or unclear in my wording. So a firm that fails means 
it disappears, it is not listed anymore. This failure can come in two different flavors. It could be shareholder induced, so that is what we refer to as a liquidation, and it can be creditor induced, so that would be really a technical bankruptcy. So when, when we are modeling failure, we are not distinguishing between liquidations and bankruptcy at all, but we also attempt to model each separately. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, I think it's, an, it's a really cool question. Let me go to my diagram. Give me a second, please. This here. So I, have, I can answer your question or I can, I can reply to your input. It, I feel just incredibly cheap for doing it in the way I do it. I have to admit we have, or I have not really given that a, a thought because we simply exclude 20 years in the middle. So that is really... Ah. Uh, not very large extent as during the Second World War, but some delistings, at least in Belgium, were also the result of war rather than something you're interested in. I see what you mean. So, so you, you're basically making the point that firms could disappear for other reasons than what we define as failures, so liquidations and bankruptcies, that you say firms could have been delisted as a result of First World War going on or affecting the Netherlands. It's, a, it's, it's, yes. good, it's good input. I, 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 I have not considered this, I have to admit, but I, I'm, I'm making a note on that, for sure. Thanks. So, but maybe to clarify, it's a very clear question that the Netherlands was actually doing really well during the first World War, but um, it's the war came out of the They were the Switzerland. Yeah. 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 My research stops at the beginning of the first one. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, 
sorry to interrupt, but but they were traded at the at the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. There were not 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 everything was listed. Okay. Yes. On the exchange. Yes. Yeah, um, so, mm -hmm. Also, now that there is a period of concentration um, from around the late 30s until the 60s. So, this, this has to do with the structure of the company. So, if you have very small companies, which is the standard until the late 1930s, mm -hmm. you would have a lot of director, late shareholders uh, who only have to deal with a few employees and their own interests and not have to deal with um, large firms. Mm -hmm. I see. I So, so the inclusion criterion that we applied were firms that were traded in the period of interest in those 102 years that were listed at the Amsterdam, at the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. So the firms that you are describing would be in our sample if they had been trading at the Amsterdam, at, at the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. Uh, I think the second point that you raised where you said these firms that you were describing uh, were, were different structurally in, 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 in the sense that they were more likely family firms, if I understood correctly. Is that right? Yes, these are basically family firms, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, but um, uh, with an MA uh, mm -hmm. structure. So, mm -hmm. I see what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> um, I see what you mean. Um, I cannot really speak to because I was not aware of, of, of the kinds of firms that you are describing. Um, but I can see how this would impact our results. So if there if there were a significant amount of those small family firms that still somehow were publicly listed at the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, you're basically raising then the criticism that the stru structural differences between our relatively large corporations that we were tracking and those small family firms you were describing, that this could impact our results depending on the number of, the, uh, number of these small firms, possibly quite, quite a lot. That's what you're saying, right? Wait, I'm sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Um, we are not really looking why they delist. We, we, of course, that is a starting point, but we really zoomed in on failures. So not just delisting for other reasons. We really looked at liquidations and bankruptcy. So two, those specific two reasons for the delisting. Sorry. Subsection of that, and you focus on this. And this raises a question of: okay, other firms may delist, 
before they go bankrupt, before they, they uh, have to go into liquidation. So how do you take this into account? So you just look at the problems when they appear. Many things may happen just before it appears. And so how do you, how do you take this into account? The second question, more related to today, is, I, mean, I don't know, for the Netherlands, but for Belgium, once you have Euronex, many people just migrated. So they just, you know, Brussels is nice, but if you can be listed in Paris or Amsterdam, it's a lot more more exciting. So they just move. And so how do you take this into account in your in your analysis? How, how does this kind of migration play? I know it's a the listing, so it's not what you're looking at, but how does it play in the whole ecosystem? Because if you look at the number of listed firms on your graph, it's become it used to be a big market, the Netherlands. Now it's a market. So I mean it's changed a lot in terms of structure. So how does this play in your analysis? Because you're comparing two peers as if you were still a big market, but it's not so much the case anymore. I see what you mean. So to respond to your question very honestly, I have not considered the point that you raised. But just to clarify, I, because I think this is a very, very meaningful comment. So you're basically saying by only only focusing on failures as, as I have defined them as either a liquidation triggered by shareholders or a bankruptcy triggered by creditors, you're basically then raising the criticism firms could have delisted for other reasons before they would have gone bankrupt or before they would have been liquidated and thus distorting our results. So that I basically miss out on a couple of observations of firms that would have failed but left the country listed elsewhere. Is that the point you're raising? Yeah, I'm taking an example of today. You have lots of compliance, you know, and if you have a hard time doing the compliance, you may want to, to be list because you don't have no compliance requirements anymore, but this is likely to be correlated to, to not be in such a good shape. So I, I was wondering about that, for example. Yeah, I feel a bit stupid. I, 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 I'm really grateful for your comment, but I feel now a little bit stupid because I have not considered that yet. Thanks for pointing it out. I think I missed an additional detail in the description of the first part. Uh, and I, I, I'm hoping you can clarify so that we understand the comparison of the two periods better. So for this shareholders driven liquidation, in those cases, what were the rights of the creditors? So if those firms had their own standing and the shareholders decided to liquidate, would the creditors be fully repaid? Do they still have priority? Because if that's the case, I don't understand from the perspective of a creditor as a stakeholder what difference the two regimes make. Right? Like you're still being fully repaid, so what do I care? Right? Whereas and so if that's the case, I think the more interesting comparison across periods is what are the determinants of bankruptcy across the two periods and how are those changes other than just all liquid all all, all be listed if you want. Because what right like what what we're interested in from a, from the creditors perspective is always like well they, they worry about uh, default and recovery default, right? So I don't necessarily understand how the rights of the creditors are changing. The two regimes might be different for other stakeholders. So if what the changing regimes is making, is driving is more survival or like longer life of um, companies once they go listed, that might be better for workers because they don't lose their job. But I still don't really get why that creates a difference for creditors. Unless I get it wrong, and when, when you have a shareholder driven liquidation, the creditors do worse. Yeah, my understanding is um, that when, a, when uh, a liquidation is triggered by the shareholders, the firm is liquidated and the proceeds of the liquidation are used to pay the outstanding debt, so to basically pay out the creditors. Right, like we would have different predictions 
Um, but why, why, can you just briefly uh, repeat for me, because you were a bit chopped off, why would you only focus, no, why would you only focus on bankruptcies and leave out the liquidations? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, creditors have strong rights to, to proceed to bankruptcy either way. And so if I'm trying to think about what are the determinants of those decisions to compare those two apples, I would be comparing the determinants of bankruptcy across the two scenarios. Yeah, ah, I, I, I see what you mean. Our, our, I think our mindset, we, while well, we try to capture a little bit more, so we, we, we try to not understand just bankruptcies, but also why shareholders were willing to pull the trigger before um, to also be able to pinpoint a little bit more the importance of the Supreme Court ruling roughly in the middle of our observation period. But I do see your point. Um, so, so what you suggested seems a little bit smaller in scope, but more in depth. I, I, I get it. I see your point, yeah. It's just, just a suggestion. Th uh, thanks for your input. Like I said, it's work in progress. So, so any input that you have, I will of course consider. I'm, I'm, I'm also recording so that I can review and, and digest your input. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florian, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, for the rest... Thank you for your feedback. Okay.